French were indignant, and George Harrison quit and returned home in disgust. But the American delegation went ahead and issued its official statement on temporary currency stabilization on June 22nd. It declared temporary stabilization impermissible, quote, because the American government feels that its efforts to raise prices are the most important contribution it can make, end quote. With temporary stabilization scuttled, the conference settled down to long-range discussions, the most important being centered in the sub-commission on, quote, immediate measures of financial reconstruction of the Monetary and Financial Commission of the conference. The British delegation began by introducing a draft resolution, one, emphasizing the importance of, quote, cheap and plentiful credit in order to raise the world level of commodity prices, and two, stating that, quote, the central banks of the principal countries should undertake to cooperate with a view to securing these conditions and should announce their intention of pursuing vigorously a policy of cheap and plentiful money by open market operations, end quote. The British thus laid stress on coordinated inflation, but said nothing about the sticking point, exchange rate stabilization. The Dutch, the Czechoslovaks, the Japanese, and the Swiss criticized the British advocacy of inflation, and the Italian delegate warned that, quote, to put one's faith in immediate measures for augmenting the volume of money and credits might lead to a speculative boom followed by an even worse slump. A hasty and unregulated flood of credit would lead to destructive results. End quote. And the French delegate stressed that no genuine recovery could occur without a sense of economic and financial security. Quote, who would be prepared to lend with the fear of being repaid in depreciated currency always before his eyes? Who would find the capital for financing vast programs of economic recovery and abolition of unemployment, as long as there is a possibility that economic struggles would be transported to the monetary field? In a word, without stable currency, there can be no lasting confidence. While the hoarding of capital continues, there can be no solution. End quote. The American delegation then submitted its own draft proposal, which was similar to the British, ignored currency stability, and advocated close cooperation between all governments and central banks for, quote, the carrying out of a policy of making credit abundantly and readily available to sound enterprise, end quote, especially by open market operations that expanded the money supply. Also, government expenditures and deficits should be synchronized between the different nations. The difference of views between the nations on inflation and prices, however, precluded any agreement in this area at the conference. On the gold question, Great Britain submitted a policy declaration and the U.S. a draft resolution which looked forward to eventual restoration of the gold standard. But again, Nothing was spelled out on exchange rates or on the crucial question of whether restoration of price inflation should come first. In both the American and British proposals, however, even the eventual gold standard would be considerably more inflationary than it had been in the 1920s. For all domestic gold circulation, whether coin or bullion, would be abolished and gold used only as a medium for settling international balances of payments. And all gold reserves ratios to currency would be lowered. As could have been predicted before the conference, there were three sets of views on gold and currency stabilization. The United States, backed only by Sweden, favored cheap money in order to raise domestic prices with currency stabilization to be deferred until a sufficient price rise had occurred. Whatever international cooperation was envisaged would stress joint inflationary action to raise price levels in some coordinated manner. The United States, moreover, went further even than Sweden in calling for reflating wholesale prices back to 1926 levels. The gold bloc attacked currency and price inflation, pointed to the early post-war experience of severe inflation and currency depreciation, 
and hence insisted on stabilization of exchanges and the avoidance of depreciation. In the confused middle were the British and the sterling bloc, who wanted price reflation and cheap credit, but also wanted eventual return to the gold standard and temporary stabilization of the key currencies. As the London Conference foundered on its severe disagreements, the gold bloc countries began to panic. For on the one hand, the dollar was failing in the exchange markets, thus making American goods and currency more competitive. And what is more, the general gloom at the conference gave international speculators the idea that in the near future, many of these countries would themselves be forced to go off gold. In consequence, money began to flow out of these countries during June and Holland and Switzerland lost more than 10% of their gold reserves during that month alone. In consequence, the gold countries launched a final attempt to draft a compromise resolution. The proposed resolution was a surprisingly mild one. It committed the signatory countries to reestablishing the gold standard and stable exchange rates, but it deliberately emphasized that the parity and date for each country to return to gold was strictly up to each individual country. The existing gold standard countries were pledged to remain on gold, which was not difficult since that was their fervent hope. The non-gold countries were to reaffirm their ultimate objective to return to gold, to try their best to limit exchange speculation in the meanwhile, and to cooperate with other central banks in these two endeavors. The innocuousness of the proposed declaration comes from the fact that it committed the United States to vary little more than its own resolution of over a week earlier to return eventually to the gold standard, coupled with a vague agreement to cooperate in limiting exchange speculation in the major currencies. The joint declaration was agreed upon by Sprague and Warburg, by James M. Cox, head of the Monetary Commission of the conference, and by Raymond Moley, who had taken charge of the delegation as a freewheeling White House advisor. Moley was Assistant Secretary of State and had been a monetary nationalist. Moley, however, sent the declaration to Roosevelt on June 30th, urging the president to accept it, especially since Roosevelt had been willing, a few weeks earlier, to stabilize at a $4.25 pound, while the depreciation of the dollar during June had now brought the market rate up to $4.40. Across the Atlantic, Under Secretary of the Treasury Dean G. Acheson, influential Wall Street financier Bernard M. Baruch, and Louis W. Douglas also strongly endorsed the London Declaration. Not hearing immediately from the president, Moley frantically wired Roosevelt the next morning that, quote, success, even continuance, of the conference depends upon United States agreement, end quote. Roosevelt cabled his rejection on July 1st, declaring that, quote, a sufficient interval should be allowed the United States to permit a demonstration of the value of price-lifting efforts which we have well in hand, end quote. Roosevelt's rejection of the innocuous agreement was in itself startling enough, but he felt that he had to add insult to injury, to slash away at the London conference so that no danger might exist of currency stabilization or of the reconstruction of an international monetary order. Hence, he sent on July 3rd an arrogant and contemptuous public message to the London conference, the famous, quote, bombshell message so named for its impact on the conference. Roosevelt began by lambasting the idea of temporary currency stabilization, which he termed a, quote, specious fallacy, a, quote, artificial and temporary diversion. Instead, Roosevelt declared that the emphasis must be placed on, quote, the sound internal economic system of a nation. In particular, quote, Old fetishes of so-called international bankers are being replaced by efforts to plan national currencies, with the objective of giving to those currencies a continuing purchasing power, which a generation hence will have the same purchasing and debt-paying power as the dollar value we hope to attain in the near future. 
That objective means more to the good of other nations than a fixed ratio for a month or two in terms of the pound or franc. End quote. In short, the president was now totally committed to the nationalist Fisher Committee for the Nation program for paper currency, currency inflation, and a very steep reflation of prices, and then stabilization of the higher internal price level. The idea of stable exchange rates and an international monetary order could fade into limbo. The World Economic Conference limped along aimlessly for a few more weeks, but the Roosevelt bombshell message effectively killed the conference, and the hope for a restored international monetary order was dead for a fateful decade. From here on in the 1930s, monetary nationalism currency blocks, and commercial and financial warfare would be the order of the day. The French were bitter and the English stricken at the Roosevelt message. The chagrined James P. Warburg promptly resigned as financial advisor to the delegation, and this was to be the beginning of the exit of this highly placed economic advisor from the Roosevelt administration. A similar fate was in store for Oliver Sprague and Dean Acheson. As for Raymond Moley, who had been repudiated by the president's action, he tried to restore himself in Roosevelt's graces by a fawning and obviously insincere telegram, only to be ousted from office shortly after his return to the States. Playing an ambivalent role in the entire affair, Bernard Baruch, who was privately in favor of the old gold standard, praised Roosevelt fulsomely for his message. Quote, until each nation puts its house in order by the same Herculean efforts that you are performing, Baruch wrote the president, quote, there can be no common denominators by which we can endeavor to solve the problems. There seems to be one common ground that all nations can take, and that is the one outlined by you, End quote. Expressions of enthusiastic support for the president's decision came, as might be expected, from Irving Fisher and George F. Warren, who urged Roosevelt to avoid any possible agreement that might limit, quote, our freedom to change the dollar any day, end quote. James A. Farley has recorded in his memoirs that Roosevelt was prompted to send his angry message by coming to suspect a plot to influence Moley in favor of stabilization by Thomas W. Lamont, partner of J.P. Morgan & Company, working through Moley's conference aide and White House advisor, Herbert Bayard Swope, who was close to the Morgans and also a longtime confidant of Baruch. This might well account for Roosevelt's bitter reference to the, quote, so-called international bankers. The situation is curious, however, since Swope was firmly on the anti-stabilizationist side, and Roosevelt's London message was greeted enthusiastically by Russell Leffingwell of Morgans, who apparently took little notice of its attack on international bankers. Leffingwell wrote to the president, quote, You were very right not to enter into any temporary or permanent arrangements to peg the dollar in relation to sterling or any other currency. End quote. From the date of the torpedoing of the London Economic Conference, monetary nationalism prevailed for the remainder of the 1930s. The United States finally fixed the dollar at $35 an ounce in January 1934, amounting to a two-thirds increase in the gold price of the dollar from its original moorings less than a year before, and to a 40% devaluation of the dollar. The gold nations continued on gold for two more years, but the greatly devalued dollar now began to attract a flood of gold from the gold countries and France was finally forced off gold in the fall of 1936, with the other major gold countries, Switzerland, Belgium, and Holland, following shortly thereafter. While the dollar was technically fixed in terms of gold, there was no further gold coin or bullion redemption within the U.S. Gold was used only as a method of clearing balances of payments, with only fitful redemption to foreign countries. The only significant act of international collaboration after 1934 came in the fall of 1936, at about the time France was forced to leave the gold standard. Partly to assist the French, the United States, 
Great Britain, and France entered into a tripartite agreement with France, beginning on September 25, 1936. The French agreed to throw in the exchange rate sponge and devalued the franc by between one-fourth and one-third. At this new par, the three governments agreed not to stabilize their currencies, but to iron out day-to-day -day fluctuations in them, to engage in mutual stabilization of each other's currencies only within each 24-hour period. This was scarcely stabilization, but it did constitute a moderating of fluctuations, as well as politico-monetary collaboration, which began with the three Western countries and soon expanded to include other former gold nations, Belgium, Holland, and Switzerland. This collaboration continued until the outbreak of World War II. At least one incident marred the harmony of the tripartite agreement. In the fall of 1938, while the United States and Britain were hammering out a trade agreement, the British began pushing the pound below $4.80. At the threat of this cheapening of the pound, U.S. Treasury officials warned Secretary of the Treasury Henry Morgenthau Jr. that if, quote, sterling drops substantially below $4.80, our foreign and domestic business will be adversely affected, end quote. In consequence, Morgenthau successfully insisted that the trade agreement with Britain must include a clause that the agreement would terminate if Britain should allow the pound to fall below $4.80. Here, we may only touch on a fascinating historical problem, which has been discussed by revisionist historians of the 1930s. To what extent was the American drive for war against Germany the result of anger and conflict over the fact that, in the 1930s as a world of economic and monetary nationalism, the Germans, under the guidance of Dr. Holmar Schacht, went their way successfully on their own, totally outside of Anglo-American control or of the confinements of what remained of the cherished American open door? A brief treatment of this question will serve as a prelude to examining the aim of the war-born, quote, Second New Deal, of reconstructing a new international monetary order, an order that in many ways resembled the lost world of the 1920s. German economic nationalism in the 1930s was, first of all, conditioned by the horrifying experience that Germany had with runaway inflation and currency depreciation during the early 1920s, culminating in the monetary collapse of 1923. Though caught with an overvalued par as each European country went off the gold standard, no German government could have politically succeeded in engaging once again in the dreaded act of devaluation. No longer on gold and unable to devalue the mark, Germany was obliged to engage in strict exchange control. In this economic climate, Dr. Schacht was particularly successful in making bilateral trade agreements with individual countries, Agreements which amounted to direct, quote, barter arrangements that angered the United States and other Western countries in totally bypassing gold and other international banking or financial arrangements. In the anti-German propaganda of the 1930s, the German barter deals were agreements in which Germany somehow invariably emerged as coercive victor and exploiter of the other country involved even though they were mutually agreed upon and therefore presumably mutually beneficial exchanges. Actually, there was nothing either diabolic or unilaterally exploitive about the barter deals. Part of the essence of the barter arrangements has been neglected by historians. The deliberate overvaluation of the exchange rates of both currencies involved in the deals. The German mark, as we have seen, was deliberately overvalued as the alternative to the specter of currency depreciation. The situation of the other currencies was a bit more complex. Thus, in the barter agreements between Germany and the various Balkan countries, especially Romania, Hungary, Bulgaria, and Yugoslavia, in which the Balkans exchanged agricultural products for German manufactured goods, the Balkan currencies were also fixed at an artificially overvalued rate vis-a-vis -vis gold and the currencies of Britain and the other Western countries. 
This meant that Germany agreed to pay higher than world market rates for Balkan agricultural products, while the latter paid higher rates for German manufactured products. For the Balkan countries, the point of all this was to force Balkan consumers of manufactured goods to subsidize their own peasants and agriculturalists. The external consequence was that Germany was able to freeze out Britain and other Western countries from buying Balkan food and raw materials. And since the British could not compete in paying for Balkan produce, the Balkan countries, in the bilateral world of the 1930s, did not have sufficient pounds or dollars to buy manufactured goods from the West. Thus, Britain and the West were deprived of raw materials and markets for their manufacturers by the astute policies of Hallmark Schacht and the mutually agreeable barter agreements between Germany and the Balkan and other, including Latin American, countries. May not Western anger at successful German competition through bilateral agreements and Western desire to liquidate such competition have been important factors in the Western drive for war against Germany? Lloyd Gardner has demonstrated the early hostility of the United States toward German economic controls and barter arrangements, its attempts to pressure Germany to shift to a multilateral, quote, open-door system for American products, and the repeated American rebuffs to German proposals for bilateral exchanges between the two countries. As early as June 26, 1933, the influential American Consul General at Berlin, George Messersmith, was warning that such continued policies would make, quote, Germany a danger to world peace for years to come, end quote. In pursuing this aggressive policy, President Roosevelt overrode Agricultural Adjustment Administration Chief George Peek, who favored accepting bilateral deals with Germany and, perhaps not coincidentally, was to be an ardent, quote, isolationist in the late 1930s. Instead, Roosevelt followed the policy of the leading interventionist and spokesman for a, quote, open door to American products, Secretary of State Cordell Hull, as well as his assistant secretary, Francis B. Sayre, son-in-law of Woodrow Wilson. By 1935, American officials were calling Germany a, quote, aggressor because of its successful bilateral trade competition, and Japan was similarly castigated for much the same reasons. By late 1938, J. Pierpont Moffat, head of the Western European Division of the State Department, was complaining that German control of Central and Eastern Europe would mean, quote, a still further extension of the area under a closed economy, end quote. And, more specifically, in May 1940, Assistant Secretary of State Breckinridge Long warned that a German-dominated Europe would mean that, quote, every commercial order will be routed to Berlin and filled under its orders somewhere in Europe rather than in the United States, end quote. And shortly before American entry into the war, John J. McCloy, later to be U.S. High Commissioner of Occupied Germany, was to write in a draft for a speech by Secretary of War Henry Stimson, quote, With German control of the buyers of Europe and her practice of governmental control of all trade, it would be well within her power, as well as the pattern she has thus far displayed, to shut off our trade with Europe, with South America, and with the Far East. End quote. Not only were Hull and the United States ardent in pressing an anti German policy against its bilateral trade system, but sometimes Secretary Hull had to whip even Britain into line. Thus, in early 1936, Cordell Hall warned the British ambassador that the quotes, clearing arrangements reached by Britain with Argentina, Germany, Italy, and other countries were handicapping the efforts of this government to carry forward its broad program with the favored nation policy underlying it. End quote. The tendency of these British arrangements was to, quote, drive straight toward bilateral trading, end quote, and they were therefore milestones on the road to war. One of the United States government's biggest economic worries was the growing competition of Germany and its bilateral trade in Latin America. 
As early as 1935, Cordell Hull had concluded that Germany was, quote, straining every tendon to undermine United States trading relations with Latin America, end quote. A great deal of political pressure was used to combat German competition. Thus, in the mid-1930s, the American Chamber of Commerce in Brazil repeatedly pressed the State Department to scuttle the Germany-Brazil barter deal, which the Chamber termed the, quote, greatest single obstacle to free trade in South America. Brazil was finally induced to cancel its agreement with Germany in exchange for a $60 million loan from the U.S. America's exporters, grouped in the National Foreign Trade Council, issued resolutions against German trade methods and pressured the government for stronger action. And in late 1938, President Roosevelt asked Professor James Harvey Rogers, an economist and disciple of Irving Fisher, to make a currency study of all of South America in order to minimize, quote, German and Italian influence on this side of the Atlantic, end quote. It is no wonder that German diplomats in Brazil, Chile, and Uruguay reported home that the United States was, quote, exerting very strong pressure against Germany commercially, end quote, which included economic, commercial, and political opposition designed to drive Germany out of the Brazilian and other South American markets. In the spring of 1935, the German ambassador to Washington desperately anxious to bring an end to American political and economic warfare, asked the United States what Germany could do to end American hostilities. The American answer, which amounted to a demand for unconditional economic surrender, was that Germany abandon its economic policy in favor of America. The American reply, quote, really meant, noted Pierpont Moffat, quote, a fundamental acceptance by Germany of our trade philosophy and a thoroughgoing partnership with us along the road of equality of treatments and the reduction of trade barriers, end quote. The United States further indicated that it was interested that Germany accept not so much the principle of the most favored national clause in all international trade, but specifically for American exports. When war broke out in September 1939, Bernard Baruch's reaction was to tell President Roosevelt that, quote, If we keep our prices down, there is no reason why we shouldn't get the customers of the belligerent nations that they have had to drop because of the war. And in that event, Baruch exalted, quote, Germany's barter system will be destroyed, end quote. But particularly significant is the retrospective comment made by Secretary Hull. Quote, War did not break out between the United States and any country with which we had been able to negotiate a trade agreement. It is also a fact that, with very few exceptions, the countries with which we signed trade agreements joined together in resisting the Axis. The political lineup follows the economic lineup. End quote. Considering that Secretary Hull was a leading maker of American foreign policy throughout the 1930s and through World War II, it is certainly a possibility that his remarks should be taken not as a quaint testimony to Hull's idée fixe on reciprocal trade, but as a positive, causal statement of the thrust of American foreign policy. Read in that light, Hull's remark becomes a significant admission rather than a flight of speculative fancy. Reinforcing this interpretation would be a similar reading of the testimony before the House of Representatives in 1945 of top Treasury aide Harry Dexter White defending the Bretton Woods Agreement. White declared, quote, I think it, a Bretton Woods system, would very definitely have made a considerable contribution to checking the war and possibly might have prevented it. A great many of the devices which Germany and Japan utilized would have been illegal in the international sphere had these countries been participating members. End quote. Is White saying that the Allies deliberately made war upon the Axis because of these bilateral, exchange control, and other competitive devices, which a Bretton Woods, or for that matter a 1920s, system would have precluded? We may take as our final testimony to the possible economic causes of World War II 
the assertion by the influential Times of London well after the start of the war. Quote, One of the fundamental causes of this war has been the unrelaxing efforts of Germany since 1918 to secure wide enough foreign markets to straighten her finances at the very time when all her competitors were forced by their own debts to adopt exactly the same course. Continuous friction was inevitable. End quote. The Second New Deal The Dollar Triumphant Whether and to what extent German economic nationalism was a cause for the American drive toward war, one point is certain, that... Even before official American entry into the war, one of America's principal war aims was to reconstruct an international monetary order. A corollary aim was to replace economic nationalism and bilateralism by the Hullian kind of multilateral trading and, quote, open door for American goods. But the most insistent drive, and the particularly successful one, was to reconstruct an international monetary system. The system in view was to resemble the gold exchange system of the 1920s quite closely. Once again, all the major world's currencies were to abandon fluctuating and nationally determined exchange rates on behalf of fixed parities with other currencies, and of all of them with gold. Once again, there was to be no full-fledged or internal gold standard for any of these nations, while in theory all currencies were to be fixed in terms of one key currency, which would form a gold exchange standard on which other nations could pyramid their own supply of domestic money. But there were two crucial differences from the 1920s. One was that, while the key currency was to be the only currency redeemable in gold, there was to be no further embarrassing possibility of internal redemption in gold. Gold was only to be a method of international payments between central banks, and never again an actual money held by the public. In this way, the key currency, and the rest of the world in response, could expand and inflate much further than in the 1920s, freed as they were from the check of domestic redemption. But the second difference was more politically far-reaching, for, instead of two joint partner key currencies, the pound and the dollar, with the dollar as workhorse junior subaltern, the only key currency now was to be the dollar, which was to be fixed at $35 to the gold ounce. The pound had had it, and just as the United States was to use World War II to replace British imperialism with its own far-flung empire, so in the monetary sphere, the United States was now to move in and take over, with the pound no less subordinate than all the other major currencies. It was truly a triumphant, quote, dollar imperialism, to parallel the imperial American thrust in the political sphere. As Secretary of the Treasury Henry Morgenthau Jr. was later to express it, the critical and eminently successful objective was, quote, to move the financial center of the world, end quote, from London to the United States Treasury. And all this eminently was in keeping with the prophetic vision of Cordell Hull, the man who, in the words of Gabrielle Colco, had, quote, the basic responsibility for American political and economic planning for the peace, end quote. For Hull had urged upon Congress as far back as 1932 that America, quote, gird itself, yield to the law of manifest destiny, and go forward as the supreme world factor economically and morally, end quote. World War II was the occasion for a new coalition to form behind the New Deal, a coalition which reintegrated many conservative, quote, internationalist financial interests who had been thrown into opposition by the domestic statism or economic nationalism of the earlier New Deal. This reintegration of the entire conservative financial community was particularly true in the field of international economic and monetary policy. Here, Dr. Leo Pasvalsky, a conservative economist who had broken with the New Deal upon the scuttling of the London Economic Conference, 
returned to a crucial role as Secretary Hull's special advisor on post-war planning. Dean Acheson, also disaffected by the radical monetary measures of 1933 to 1934, was now back as Assistant Secretary of State for Economic Affairs. And when the ailing Cordell Hull retired in late 1944, he was replaced by Edward Statinius, the son of a Morgan partner and himself former president of Morgan-oriented U.S. Steel. Statinius chose as his assistant secretary for economic affairs the man who quickly became the key official for post-war international economic planning, William L. Clayton, a former leader of the Anti-New Deal Liberty League and chairman and major partner of Anderson, Clayton & Company, the world's largest cotton export firm. Clayton's major focus in post-war planning was to promote and encourage American exports, with cotton, not unnaturally, never out of the forefront of his concerns. Even before American entry into the war, U.S. economic war aims were well-defined and rather brutally simple. They hinged on a determined assault upon the 1930 system of economic and monetary nationalism, so as to promote American exports, investments, and financial dealings overseas. In short, the quote, open door for American commerce. In the sphere of commercial policy, this took the form of pressure for reduction of tariffs on American products and the elimination of quantitative import restrictions on those products. In the allied sphere of monetary policy, it meant the breakup of powerful nationalistic currency blocks and the restoration of an international monetary order based on the dollar in which currencies would be convertible into each other at predictable and fixed parities, and there would be a minimum of national exchange controls over the purchase and use of foreign currencies. And even as the United States prepared to enter the war to save its ally, Great Britain, it was preparing to bludgeon the British at a time of great peril to abandon their sterling bloc which they had organized effectively after the Ottawa Agreements of 1932. World War II would presumably deal effectively with the German bilateral trade and currency menace, but what about the problem of Great Britain? John Maynard Lord Keynes long had led those British economists who had urged a policy of all-out economic and monetary nationalism on behalf of inflation and full employment. He had gone so far as to hail Roosevelt's torpedoing of the London Economic Conference because the path was then cleared for economic nationalism. Keynes's visit to Washington on behalf of the British government in the summer of 1941 now spread gloom about the British determination to continue their bilateral economic policies after the war. High State Department official J. Pierpont Moffat despaired that, quote, the future is clouding up rapidly, and that despite the war, the Hitlerian commercial policy will probably be adopted by Great Britain. End quote. The United States responded by putting the pressure on Great Britain at the Atlantic Conference in August 1941. Under Secretary of State Sumner Wells insisted that the British agree to remove discrimination against American exports and abolish their policies of autarky exchange controls, and imperial preference blocks. Prime Minister Churchill tartly refused, but the United States was scarcely prepared to abandon its crucial aim of breaking down the sterling bloc. As President Roosevelt privately told his son Elliot at the Atlantic Conference, quote, It's something that's not generally known, but the British bankers and German bankers have had world trade pretty well sewn up in their pockets for a long time. Well now, that's not so good for American trade, is it? If in the past German and British economic interests have operated to exclude us from world trade, kept our merchant shipping closed down, closed us out of this or that market, and now Germany and Britain are at war, what should we do? End quote. The signing of Lend-Lease Agreements was the ideal time for wringing concessions from the British, but Britain consented to sign the agreement's Article 7, which merely involved a vague commitment to the elimination of discriminatory treatment in international trade, 
only after intense pressure by the United States. The agreement was signed at the end of February 1942, and in return the State Department pledged to the British that the U.S. would pursue a policy of economic expansion and full employment after the war. Even after these conditions, however, Britain soon maintained that the Lend-Lease Agreement committed it to virtually nothing. To Cordell Hull, however, the agreement on Article 7 was decisive and constituted, quote, a long step toward the fulfillment, after the war, of the economic principles for which I had been fighting for half a century, end quote. The United States also insisted that other nations receiving Lend-Lease sign a virtually identical commitment to multilateralism after the war. In his first major public address in nearly a year, Hull, in July 1942, could now look forward confidently that, quote, leadership toward a new system of international relationships in trade and other economic affairs will devolve very largely upon the United States because of our great economic strength. We should assume this leadership and the responsibility that goes with it primarily for reasons of pure national self-interest, end quote. In the post-war planning for economic affairs, the State Department was in charge of commercial and trade policies, while the Treasury conducted the planning in the areas of money and finance. In charge of post-war international financial planning for the Treasury was the economist Harry Dexter White. In early 1942, White presented his first plan, which was to be one of the two major foundations of the post-war monetary system. White's proposal was of course within the framework of American post-war economic objectives. The countries of the world were to join a stabilization fund, totaling $5 billion, which would lend funds at short term to deficit countries to iron out temporary balance of payments difficulties. But in return for this provision of greater liquidity and short-term aid to deficit countries, exchange rates of currencies were to be fixed, in relation to the dollar and hence to gold, with the gold price to be set at $35 an ounce, and exchange controls were to be abandoned by the various nations. While the White Plan envisioned a substantial amount of inflation to provide greater currency liquidity, the British responded with a Keynes plan that was far more inflationary. By this time, Lord Keynes had abandoned economic and monetary nationalism for Britain under severe American pressure, and his aim was to salvage as much domestic inflation and cheap money for Britain as he could possibly induce America to accept. The Keynes Plan envisioned an International Clearing Union, or ICU, which, in return for agreeing to stable exchange rates between currencies and the abandonment of exchange control, provided a huge loan fund to its members of $26 billion. The Keynes Plan, moreover, provided for a new international monetary unit, the, quote, Bancor, which could be issued by the ICU in such large amounts as to provide almost unchecked room for inflation, even in a country with a large deficit in its balance of payments. The nations would consult with each other about correcting balance of payments disequilibria, through altering their exchange rates. The Keynes plan, furthermore, provided automatic access to the fund of liquidity, with none of the embarrassing requirements, as included in the White Plan, for deficit countries to cease creating deficits by inflating their currency. Whereas the White Plan authorized the stabilization fund to require deficit countries to cease inflating in return for fund loans, the Keynes plan envisioned that inflation would proceed unchecked, with all the burden of necessary adjustments to be placed on the hard money creditor countries, who would be expected to inflate faster themselves in order not to gain currency from the deficit nations. The White Plan was stringently attacked by the conservative nationalists and inflationists in Britain, particularly G. R. Boothby, Lord Beaverbrook, The Times of London, and the Economist. The Keynes Plan was attacked by conservatives in the United States, as was even the White Plan for interfering with market forces and for automatic extension of credit to deficit countries. 
critical of the white plan with a guarantee survey of the Guarantee Trust Company and the American Bankers Association. Furthermore, the New York Times and New York Herald Tribune called for return to the classical gold standard and attacked the large measure of governmental financial planning envisioned by both the Keynes and White proposals. After negotiating during 1943 and into the spring of 1944, the United States and Britain hammered out a compromise of the White and Keynes plans in April 1944. The compromise was adopted by a World Economic Conference in July at Bretton Woods, New Hampshire. It was Bretton Woods that was to provide the monetary framework for the post-war world. The compromise established an International Monetary Fund, or IMF, as the stabilization mechanism. Its total funds were fixed at $8.8 .8 billion, far closer to the Whites than to the Keynes prescriptions. Its balance of IMF international control as against domestic autonomy lay between the Whites and Keynes plans, leaving the whole problem highly fuzzy. On the one hand, national access to the fund was not to be automatic. But on the other, the fund could no longer require corrective domestic economic policies of its members. On the question of exchange rates, the Americans yielded to the British insistence on allowing room for domestic inflation even at the expense of stable exchange rates. The compromise provided that each country could be free to make a 10% change in its exchange rates, and that larger changes could be made to correct, quote, fundamental disequilibria. In short, that a chronically deficit country could devalue its currency rather than check its own inflation. Furthermore, the U.S. yielded again in allowing creditor countries to suffer by permitting deficit countries to impose exchange controls on, quote, scarce currencies. This meant, in effect, that the major European countries, whose currencies would be fixed at existing, highly overvalued rates in relation to the dollar, would thus be permitted to enter the IMF with chronically overvalued currencies and then impose exchange controls on, quote, scarce, undervalued dollars. But despite these extensive concessions, there was no, quote, bancor. The dollar, fixed at $35 per gold ounce, was now to be firmly established as the key currency base of a new world monetary order. Besides, for the dollar to be undervalued and other major currencies to be overvalued greatly spurs American exports, which was one of the basic aims of the entire operation. U.S. Ambassador to Britain John G. Winant recorded the perceptive hostility to the Bretton Woods agreements by the majority of the directors of the Bank of England. For these men saw, quote, that if the plan is adopted, financial control will leave London and sterling exchange will be replaced by dollar exchange, end quote. The proposed International Monetary Fund ran into a storm of conservative opposition in the United States from the opposite pole of the hostility of the British nationalists. The American attack on the IMF was essentially launched by two major groups, conservative Eastern bankers and Midwestern isolationists. Among the bankers, the American Bankers Association, or ABA, attacked the unsound and inflationary policy of allowing debtor countries to control access to international funds. And W. Randolph Burgess, president of the ABA, denounced the provision for debtor rationing of, quote, scarce currencies as an abomination. The New York Times urged rejection of the IMF and proposed making loans to Britain in exchange for the abolition of exchange controls and quantitative restrictions on imports. Another bankers group came up with a, quote, key currency proposal as a substitute for Bretton Woods. This key currency plan was proposed by economist John H. Williams, vice president of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, and was endorsed by Leon Frazier, president of the First National Bank of New York and by Winthrop W. Aldrich, head of the Chase National Bank. It envisioned a bilateral pound-dollar stabilization, fueled by a large transitional American loan, or even grant, to Great Britain. Thus, 
the key currency people were ready to abandon temporarily not only the classical gold standard, but even an international monetary order, and to stay temporarily in a modified version of the world of the 1930s. The Midwestern isolationist critics of the IMF were led by Senator Robert A. Taft, Republican from Ohio, who charged that while the bulk of the valuable hard money placed in the fund would be American dollars, the dollars would be subject to international control by the fund authorities, and therefore by the debtor countries. The debtor countries could then still continue exchange controls and sterling block practices. Here, Taft failed to realize that formal and informal structures in the Bretton Woods design would ensure effective United States control of both the IMF and the International Bank. The administration countered the critics of Bretton Woods with a massive propaganda campaign, which was able to drive the agreement through Congress by mid-July 1945. It emphasized that the U.S. government would have effective control, at least of its own representatives in the fund. It played up, in what proved to be gross exaggeration, the favorable aspects of the various ambiguous provisions, insisting that debtor access to the fund would not be automatic, that exchange controls would be removed, and that exchange rates would be stabilized. It pushed heavily the vague idea that the fund was crucial to post-war international cooperation to keep the peace. Particularly interesting was the argument of Will Clayton and others that Bretton Woods would facilitate the general commercial policy of eliminating trade discrimination and barriers against American exports. This argument was put particularly boldly by Treasury Secretary Morgenthau in a speech to Detroit industrialists. Morgenthau promised that the Bretton Woods agreement would lead to a world trade freed from exchange controls and depreciated currencies, and that this would greatly increase the exports of American automobiles. Since the fund would begin operations the following year by accepting the existing, grossly overvalued currency parities that most of the nations insisted upon, this meant that Morgenthau might have known whereof he spoke. For if other currencies are overvalued and the dollar undervalued, American exports are indeed encouraged and subsidized. It is perhaps understandable, then, that not only the major farm, labor, and New Deal liberal organizations pushed for Bretton Woods, but that the large majority of industrial and financial interests also approved the agreement and urged its passage in Congress. American approval in mid-1945 was followed after lengthy soul-searching by the approval of Great Britain at the end of the year. By the end of its existence, therefore, the Second New Deal had established the triumphant dollar as the base of a new international monetary order. The dollar had displaced the pound, and within a general political framework in which the American empire had replaced the British. Looking forward perceptively to the post-war world in January 1945, Lamar Fleming Jr., president of Anderson Clayton and Company, wrote to his longtime colleague Will Clayton that the quote, British Empire and British international influence is a myth already. End quote. The United States would soon become the British protector against the emerging Russian landmass, prophesied Fleming, and this would mean, quote, the absorption into the American empire of the parts of the British empire which we will be willing to accept, end quote. As the New Deal came to a close, the triumphant United States stood ready to reap its fruits on a worldwide scale. Epilogue The Bretton Woods Agreement established the framework for the international monetary system down to the early 1970s. A new and more restricted international dollar-gold exchange standard had replaced the collapsed dollar-pound-gold exchange standard of the 1920s. During the early post-war years, the system worked quite successfully within its own terms, and the American banking community completely abandoned its opposition. With European currencies inflated and overvalued, and European economies exhausted, the undervalued dollar was the strongest and, quote, hardest of world currencies. A world, quote, dollar shortage prevailed, and the dollar could base itself upon the vast stock of gold in the United States, 
much of which had fled from war and devastation abroad. But in the early 1950s, the world economic balance began slowly but emphatically to change. For while the United States, influenced by Keynesian economics, proceeded blithely to inflate the dollar, seemingly relieved of the limits imposed by the classical gold standard, several European countries began to move in the opposite direction. Under the revived influence of conservative, free markets, and hard money-oriented economists in such countries as West Germany, France, Italy, and Switzerland, these newly recovered countries began to achieve prosperity with far less inflated currencies. Hence these currencies became ever stronger and, quote, harder, while the dollar became softer and increasingly inflated. The continuing inflation of the dollar began to have two important consequences. First, the dollar was increasingly overvalued in relation to gold. And second, the dollar was also increasingly overvalued in relation to the West German mark, the French and Swiss francs, the Japanese yen, and other hard money currencies. The result was a chronic and continuing deficit in the American balance of payments, beginning in the early 1950s and persisting ever since. The consequence of the chronic deficit was a continuing outflow of gold abroad and a heavy piling up of dollar claims in the central banks of the hard money countries. Since 1960, the foreign short-term claims to American gold have therefore become increasingly greater than the U.S. gold supply. In short, just as inflation in England and the United States during the 1920s led finally to the breakdown of the international monetary order, so has inflation in the post-war key country, the United States, led to increasing strains and fissures in the triumphant dollar order of the post-World War II world. It has become increasingly evident that an ever more inflated and overvalued dollar cannot continue as the permanently secure base of the world monetary system, and therefore that this ever more strained and insecure system cannot long continue in anything like its present form. In fact, the post-war system has already been changed considerably in an ultimately futile attempt to preserve its basic features. In the spring of 1968, a severe monetary run on the dollar by Europeans redeeming dollar claims led to two major changes. One was the partial abandonment of the fixed $35 per ounce gold price. Instead, a two-price or, quote, two-tier gold price system was established. The dollar and gold were allowed to find their own level in the free gold markets of the world with the United States no longer standing ready to support the dollar in the gold market at $35 an ounce. On the other hand, $35 still continued as the supposedly eternally fixed price for the world's central banks, who were pledged not to sell gold in the world market. Keynesian economists were convinced that with the dollar and gold severed on the world market, the price of gold would then fall in the freely fluctuating market. The reverse, however, has occurred, since the world market continued to have more faith in the soundness and relative hardness of gold than in the increasingly inflated dollar. The second change was the creation in 1969 of Special Drawing Rights, or SDRs, a new form of, quotes, paper gold, of newly created paper which can supplement gold as an international currency reserve behind each currency. While this indeed put more backing behind the dollar, the quantity of SDRs has been too limited to make an appreciable difference to a world economy that trusts the dollar less with each passing year. These two minor repairs, however, fail to change the fundamental overvaluation of the ever more inflated dollar. In the spring of 1971, a new monetary crisis finally led to a massive revaluation of the hard currencies. If the United States stubbornly refused to lose face by raising the price of gold or by otherwise devaluing the dollar down to its genuine value in the world market, then the harder currencies, such as West Germany, Switzerland, and the Netherlands, found themselves reluctantly forced to raise the value of their currencies. Their alternatives, 
a massive calling upon the United States to redeem in gold and thereby the smashing of the facade of dollar redemption in gold was too much of a political break with the U.S. for these nations to contemplate. For the United States, to preserve the facade of gold redemption at $35 had been using intense political pressure on its creditors to retain their dollar balances and not to redeem them in gold. By the late 1960s, General Charles de Gaulle, under the influence of classical gold standard advocate Jacques Ruff, was apparently preparing to make just such a challenge. To break the dollar standard as a move toward restoring the classical gold standard in France and much of the rest of Europe. But the French domestic troubles in the spring of 1968 ended that dream, at least temporarily, as France was forced to inflate the franc for a time in order to pay the overall wage increase it had agreed upon under the threats of the general strike. Despite these hasty repairs, it is becoming increasingly evident that they are makeshift stopgaps and that a series of more aggravated crises will shake the international monetary order until a fundamental change is made. A hard money policy in the United States that put an end to inflation and increased the soundness of the dollar might sustain the current system, but this is so politically remote as to hardly be a likely prognosis. There are several possible monetary systems that might replace the present deteriorating order. The new system desired by the Keynesian economists and the American government would be a massive extension of, quote, paper gold to demonetize gold completely and replace it with a new monetary unit, such as the Keynesian, quote, bank or, and a paper currency issued by a new World Reserve Bank. If this were achieved, then the new American-dominated World Reserve Bank would be able to inflate any currencies indefinitely and allow inflating currencies to pay for any and all deficits ad infinitum. While such a scheme, embodied in the Triffin Plan, the Bernstein Plan, and others, is now the American dream, it has met determined opposition by the hard-money countries and it remains doubtful that the United States will be able to force these countries to go along with the plan. The other logical alternative is the rough plan, of returning to the classical gold standard after a massive increase in the world price of gold. But this too is unlikely, especially over powerful American opposition. Barring acceptance of a new world currency, the Americans would be content to keep inflating and simply force the hard money countries to keep appreciating their exchange rates. But again, it is doubtful that German, French, Swiss, and other exporters will be content to keep crippling themselves in order to subsidize dollar inflation. Perhaps the most likely prognosis is the formation of a new hard money European currency bloc, which might eventually be strong enough to challenge the dollar politically as well as economically. In that case, the dollar standard will probably fall apart, and we may see a return to the currency blocks of the 1930s, with the European bloc this time on a harder and quasi-gold basis. It is at least possible that the future will see gold and the hard European currencies at last dethrone the triumphant but increasingly uneasy dollar.